Alright, we'll begin. Vino Madunai Lo Heno Aleno Masi Aldena Kor and Aleno Masi Aldena Kor and Now I'd like to welcome everybody to the Shur for tonight in Share Ora. I'd like to dedicate the Shur tonight for Fashima for all the Jews, Jewish people that are been afflicted by the Mahala of the of this virus. May they have a speedy recovery and return back to the health that they had before. El Marafan Alahem, El Marafan Alahem, El Marafan Alahem. Also, the Fashema for Sheva ben Hatun Hana, and also for Reuven ben Hatun Hana, El Narafan Alahem, El Narafan Alahem, El Narafan Alahem. So, this book, Sha'are Ora, that we're discussing uh, today, uh, that we're doing on Monday nights, is basically a book that teaches us the meaning of the different names of Hashem. This is one of the introductory books to the Kabbalah, to the Sod, to the secrets of the Torah. Uh, However, one would suggest that it's very difficult to imagine how a person can actually pray with Kavanah or a person can study Torah with all the names of Hashem that are in the different Tefilot without having studied this book. And in fact, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato, Zichron Tzadik Livracha, specifically says, if I'm not mistaken, in the Derech Hashem, he says in that book that a person who doesn't study the Sod is basically not studying Emunah. So we see the study of the Sod, or the secrets of the Torah, is really uh, the, for the purposes of understanding uh, and for developing our emunah. And one of the things that's mentioned is that it says when a person gets to the Shamayim after 120 years, uh, basically there are three questions that get asked. And first question is, Nasata venatata be'emunah. Uh, the second question is, Kavata itim la Torah. And the third question is, Sipita la Yeshua. So the first question is usually translated as, did you give and take in honesty? Were you honest in business? But there's another understanding of that question. What is nasata venatata be'emuna? Did you give and take in faith? Meaning what? Did you study emunat Hashem? Did you study? The first one of the aseret brought is anochi Hashem elokecha. I am the Lord your God. So the first mitzvah of every Jew is to understand what does this mean when we say, how do we understand to the best of our ability the names of Hashem and how he acts in the world? And a person, it's very difficult to achieve that without studying the sod at all. The second question is, did you set aside time to learn? Baruch Hashem, the classes that we're giving now over the uh, over the WebEx is uh, allowing us to fulfill the mitzvah of setting aside time to learn. Um, and the first question is a really a prerequisite for the second question. Because how can a person learn Torah l'shma, l'shem shamayim, if he doesn't understand what the shemot of Hashem are? So that's one answer. That's the way a person can learn Torah l'shem shamayim, is through studying and understanding and learning about the names of Hashem. And the bracha in the morning that we say, which is called Birkata Torah, it says, anachnu kulanu shemecha that we have to be Yodei Hashem. First, we have to know the names of God intimately, deeply. And then we are Lom De Torah Ta. And then we are learning the Torah. So we see an aspect of learning the Torah, of course, is understanding the names of Hashem. And then to finish up that, the third question is there, Tzipita La Yeshua. Did you anticipate the coming of the Mashiach? And the second question is actually a prerequisite for the third question. There are many people who are looking forward to the Mashiach, but they don't understand that what our full-time job is going to be when the Mashiach comes is to learn Torah, is to sit together and study Torah. And if a person is not interested in studying Torah, chas v'shalom, before the Mashiach comes, why is he anticipating for the coming of the Mashiach if that's all he's going to do? If he doesn't enjoy studying Torah now, how is he going to be able to understand and, and enjoy studying Torah later on? And that's why one of the things that this book talks about is Lit Aneg Al Hashem that was discussed in the second, I think, and in the third class. To have pleasure Al Hashem, meaning what? Through understanding name names of Hashem and through having this intimate relationship with Hashem, this is how a person can truly get ta'anug in the world, real pleasure in the world. Not the typical pleasures of the flesh, but the pleasures, the spiritual pleasures are achieved through studying the Torah and knowing the sodot and knowing the secrets of the Torah. So we are on Daf Kaf Zayin, page number 27. I've sent the sources for those of you who can follow along in the book. And we're up to the beginning of the top of the page over there. 
So what he's doing, what the rabbi is doing now in the introduction to the book here, is he's giving us various warnings. And that's basically been the topic of the previous shiur and the one before that. Giving us warnings. When a person is going to learn the names of Hashem, God forbid he might be tempted to use the names of Hashem in order to achieve a physical changes in the world. This is completely forbidden. This is not allowed. Uh, and with tremendous, tremendous risk to a person's world in the world to come and life in this world, which is what she discussed last week. I advise you, if you missed the first, uh, the other two shirim, to please listen to them. It's very important to understand the warnings the rabbi is given here, Rabbi Yosef Gikatilia. So when a person is going to go through this book and start studying things and have a good understanding or a better understanding in the names of Hashem, the Chas Shalom remember that the purposes of studying the names of Hashem is not la'asot, is not to do. The purpose of learning Hashem, the names of Hashem, is so we can understand the Torah better, and so our tefillah can be with more kavanah, and we can understand and hopefully our tefillot will be answers. And especially in a time like this, where our prayers, it's so important for us to have our tefillot answered, how important it is to make sure that we can be praying and knowing the name of Hashem. So continue on in Dav Kaf Zayin, it says over here, Halo ki ba'et hatsara hizkir Yaakov el Shaddai, of course, you could notice and see that when Yaakov Avinu was in trouble, what did he do? He mentioned the name El Shaddai. El, which means powerful God, Shaddai. The word Shaddai is Shamar Olamo Dai, which means that it is a limitation of uh, that. And we'll see what this means shortly. The Amar El Shaddai, Yiten Lachem Rachamim. And this is what Yaakov Avinu said El Shaddai, Yiten Lachem Rachamim. The Daniel sheet Palel El Mikdash, when Daniel prayed to for the Mikdash, prayed for the benefit of the temple to be rebuilt, Amar, the Ha'er Panecha Al Mitashika Hashemem Lemaan Adonai, that you should uh, enlighten your face, your countenance on your Mikdash, on your sanctuary that is destroyed for the sake of Aleph Dalad Nunyud. So we see that the various prophets are using different names and depending on their tefillot. And this is the essential part to understand. And even though the rabbis explained in Masechet Brachot, so the rabbis in Masechet Brachot, what did they do? They explained and said it should be Lama'an, what does the mean over that the, uh, Avraham Avinu, it says in Masechet Brachot, was the first person, was the first uh, individual to call God Aleph Dalad Nun Yud. And that is, of course, in Parashat Lech Lecha. So the rabbis explain this pasuk. What does it mean, Lema'an Adonai, that it says in the pasuk? Lema'an, for the sake of the one who was the first one to call you, Aleph, Dalad, Nun, Yun. That's how the rabbis explain in Masech Brachot this statement of Daniel. But that's on the Niglas side. That's on the revealed side. On the Sod side, and the secret, there's a reason specifically why Daniel used the name Aleph, Dalad, Nun, Yud here, specifically for this. And this will be discussed in the book. The Chana, of course, he's bringing all the different prophets, because what do we know about the prophets? Baruch Hashem, our rabbis have, and our chachamim have tremendous close relationships with God. And all of us, whether we're chacham or whether we're not such chacham, all of us are talking to God. But the prophets are the ones who don't only talk to God, but God talks to them. So their relationship with God is much, much closer. What made Moshe Rabbeinu the closest man that ever was to God was not based on his wisdom, not based on his chokhmah, because we know Shlomo HaMelech had a greater amount of chokhmah than Moshe Rabbeinu. But when Moshe Rabbeinu had his prophetic ability, he had the ability to connect to God better than anyone else. So prophets, out of all of the other individuals, Individuals have the greatest ability to connect to God. And they do this through the Shemot, through understanding the Sodot and the secrets of the Torah. So now it brings Chana. The Chana, Shit Palala, Shiten La Hashem, Zera Anashim. Chana was praying, she's the mother, of course, of Shmuel. Chana was praying that she should have a son, Zera Anashim, seed of men, which means to have a child. Makitiv, what is it written over there? Adonai Tsevaot Imrao Tire Baoni Amatecha. Using the name Aleph Dal, I'm sorry, Yudke Vavke Tsadi Bavet 
Aleph Vav Tav, Hashem Tzvaot, meaning what? That's a specific name she used when she was asking for children. If you will surely see me in the poverty or the low level of your servant. So we see that the various prophets use the different names. And it's not random. There's reasons why they're using each one of these names. And even though in Masechet Brachot, they explained what they explained in Masechet Brachot, which means they explained this on the Nigla side, on the revealed side, but there is still a deeper meaning that is hidden here, and that's what he's going to be discussing in this book. And I didn't come here to give drashot, which means he's not coming here to tell you what the Gemara says about these Pesukim. But I came to tell you the essential meaning of the Pesukim, as they relate to the name of Hashem. And even though that is so, we have to hear, the rabbi says he has to submit to us and give to us an ikar, an essential element, and a root so that we can rely on. So that when we pray, we understand the various names and what they mean and how they, how they function in our prayers. Da, you shall surely know. I'm sorry, let's read you Tet. So it says over here, Shedashu bo brachot ma shedashu. So the rabbi in the bottom over there is going to bring Ita bi brachot. It's brought in Masechet Brachot in Daf Lamed Aleph Amud Bet. Amar Rabbi Elazar, Miyom Shebara Kadosh Baruch Et Olamo, from the time that God created His world, Lo Haya Adam Shekera O LeHakadosh Baruch Hu Tzvaot. There was no man, there was no individual that called God the name Tzvaot. Ad Shabbat Chana, until Chana came, the Karato Tzvaot, and Chana called Hashem Tzvaot. Amra Chana Lifnei HaKadosh Baruch Hu. What did Chana say before Hashem? What did she say? Ribono Shalala, Master of the Universe. Mikol Tzvaet Tzvaot Shebarata Be'olamecha, from all the individual armies that you have built in your world, is it difficult for you to give me one son? So we see the name Tzadi Bet Alavav Tav Tzvaot is connected to bringing children into the world. Continuing on. Re'elekaman, and look in the future, which means the rabbi, the rabbi in the bottom who's giving a commentary is basically telling you that uh, Rabbi Gikatilia is going to deal with this later on in Shar Gimel and Dalit. Shebi era benu that our rabbi explained sheit palala chana b'shem zeh that chana prayed and used this name in her tefillah limshoch habanim to draw sons to draw children mishem. Eyeh, from the name Aleph He Yud He, which is representative of the Keter. And what do we say about the name Aleph He Yud He? That is the Ratzon of Hashem, that is the will of Hashem. So she wanted to draw from the will of Hashem that she should have a son, that she should have a child. Shehu HaMakor HaElyon, that the name Aleph He Yud He is the Makor, is the source, the elevated source of everything. Derech Netzach Vehod Hanikraim Tzvaot, by way of the Sfirot of Netzach and Hod, which are called Tzvaot. He's going to talk about this later on in the book. He's just giving an he's just giving you a, a sight of what he's what he's going to talk about in the future. Vehem Makom Hamshachat Habanim, and this is the place of Hamshachat Habanim. Now let me explain that. All the ten Sfirot correspond, okay, or have an analogy in the various limbs of the human being of a person. So the keter, which is the crown, corresponds to the, the skull of a person, the, the gulgolta, the skull. The chokhmah, which is the next sphira, corresponds to the right brain. The bina corresponds to the left brain. The da'at, when you're looking at the da'at, not the keter, corresponds to the shidra, to the medulla and the spinal cord. The chesed, which is the next sphera, corresponds to the right 
hand or the right arm. The givura corresponds to the left arm. The tiferet corresponds to the goof, the body of the person, which means the trunk and the stomach. The netzach corresponds to the right leg or the right thigh. The hod corresponds to the left leg. The yesod in a man corresponds to the member, and the atara, or the malchut, corresponds to the crown, or what we would call the, the, the end of the, of, the, of the man's member. In a lady, it's, the, the, it's that part of her reversed, which is exactly what it is if one thinks about it. And I'm not going to go into an anatomy lesson. Hopefully everybody understands what I'm talking about. So netzach and hod correspond to the thighs, okay? And chana, being a woman, this is how children are brought into the world. So that's why she was using the name Tzadi Bet Aleph Vav Taf, which corresponds to right and left thighs. Continuing on. That their role What is the function of a person's legs? What they do is they move a person from one place to another to change a person's place and to allow him to function and act in different areas, in different places. Like soldiers or like an army, who fulfill the will of the king, and continue his kingship, by going and walking to different places, this is how they fulfill the will of the king. So, of course, this is an analogy. One shouldn't think there's any physicality whatsoever in the Shemaim. That's a whole different discussion. There is no physicality in Shemaim at all. This is all analogy to understand that just like the Sfirot is called Ha'ilan, the tree, Ha'ilan HaKadosh, it's like a tree, Adam is also called Etz hasadeh. There's a pasuk that says, Ki hadam etz hasadeh. So a person is also like a tree. And this is the meaning. And so the, the sfirot are the way that God interacts with the world. And when it says in Breshit that God created Adam betzelem elokim, this is the rem as to what we're talking about. I'm going off topic. Coming back to the top, okay, where it says over there on the top part, da, you shall know. All of the holy names of Hashem that are mentioned in the Torah, all of the names of Hashem that are written in the Torah, which means the ten names that we discussed in last Shi'ur, they are all basically tluim, which means hanging on the name Yud Kevavke. The im tomar, and if you're going to say v'halo shem alef hey yud hey hu ha'ikar v'amakor, we just said that the name ehye corresponds to the keter. That is a higher level than the yud ke vav ke, which corresponds to the tif eret, which corresponds to the trunk. So how can we say what he just said? It doesn't make any sense. If the alef hey yud hey is a higher name, why is that not considered to be what everything is talui on? Look on the bottom on kaf, shem alef hey yud hey hu ha'ikar v'hamakor, shem alef hey yud hey hu keneged keter. The name ehye is keneged the keter. Kamo shekatav bazohar, like it's written in the Zohar, bezel l'shono shem ehye kilala ustima de kadmita. The name alef hey yud hey is the klala, which means it's the kolel. We have to understand there's certain concepts that we're going to learn. There's a klal, and then there's a prat. There's a general, and then there's a detail. All of the details are inside the general concept, which means that something that is general covers all the details. So the klal is the name Aleph Hey Yud Hey, which means that is the, the klal. Everything else falls within it. Continuing on, ustima de kadmita, but it is hidden. Early, it is hidden. 
V'dahu kitra ila. This is the high, the uh, the keter elyon, the crown, the exalted crown. Resha dechol reshin, the beginning of all beginnings. This is the crown. This is represented by the sphira of the keter, and that's that's where he stops there. Ubi'er haramban, and the rabban explained in Sefer Shmot. Et kavanat Hashem v'zeloshano. What does the name mean? When remember when Moshe Rabbeinu was on Har Sinai, and God says, "Go rescue the Jewish people." And what does Moshe say? He says, "The people are going to ask me, what's your name? What shall I tell them?" And God's answer over there is, "Tell them, Eheye Asher Eheye, Ko Tarma LeBet Yaakov Eheye Shelachani Alechem." Meaning what? That that's the name that was told to Moshe Rabbeinu. It will be as it will be. That's the direct translation of what that name means. But when you tell the Jewish people, don't say, just tell them, that one name is what rescued them. And if you look at the Ramban, if I'm not mistaken, the Chaim, has a beautiful explanation that he suggests that really this was not going to be the final redemption. Because when Moshe Rabbeinu was asking, they're going to ask me, what's the name? What shall I say? What was he really asking? He was asking, in what midah, in what attribute of Hashem are we going to be rescued? How is the action going to be? If it's midat hadin, if it's true judgment, that means that we deserve to be taken out of Egypt. If it's through rachamim, then we don't deserve to be taken out of Egypt. The name Aleph Hey Yud Hey represents Rachamim regardless of whether or not a person is a tzaddik or a rasha. Unlimited Rachamim regardless of the person whether he deserves it or not. So when Moshe was asking because he looked at his watch and he said, God, we're going out a little early. Avraham was told 400 years, it's only 210. So God is telling him, no, I'm taking them out because of mercy. I'm not taking them out because they deserve to come out. They don't deserve to come out, but I'm taking them out because of mercy. And therefore, from this, Moshe Rabbeinu understood when God said, eh, yeah, sure, eh, yeah, there's going to be a future redemption, which means what? God is telling Moshe Rabbeinu, this is not the last redemption. There's a redemption in the future. So, but that, what does that mean? Of course, that means if there's a redemption in the future, that must mean there's going to be another exile in the future. So when God told Moshe Rabbeinu, he's basically saying, yes, this is a redemption, but it's not full. Okay, in the future is going to be the full redemption, which is what we're waiting for Bezrat Hashem right now. But when you go tell the Jewish people, they can hear that this is not the final redemption. Just tell them, the name you'd give Aleph uh, Hey uh, Yud uh, Hey. Don't let them know that there's going to be a future redemption because then they'll also understand that there's going to be a future exile. So all of these names have meaning. And we see that Amban over there explains the Kavana of the name of Aleph Hey Yud Hey, the Zelo Shono, going back inside the book. The Ota Aleph Berishon More Al Hakdamot Vehayichud Ayachid. The letter Aleph represents Rishon. It's the first of the letters. And it's More al Hakdamut Vehayachid. It reminds us or it tells us about the first, Hakdamut, which means something that is first, and Yachid, one, because the gematria of the Aleph is one. The Hayod, the Yod, Yud Vav Yud, notice how he spells it that way. Bisheni al Eses Sifirot Blima. And the Yod represents the ten Sfirot al Blima. I'm not going to go into details about that. We'll talk about that Bezrat Hashem uh, at another time. The Yod represents the second, which is the the the, the ten Sfirot that is uh, that is that is in addition to that. The Kavanato, and what is the Kavana here? Kevan Keter Neelam. The Keter is Neelam. What does it mean, Neelam? It is hidden. Ilat ha'ilot ve'sibat ha'sibot, it says. It is the exalted amongst the exalted and the source of all sources. This is beyond human comprehension. Nobody can understand the ratzon of Hashem. This is something that is beyond human comprehension. The only individual that can understand the will of God is God himself. Not even the angels have the ability to understand the ratzon of Hashem. 
where we as human beings can begin to understand is from the Chochmah and on. We do not have any understanding from the Keter. Everything begins with the Chochmah. And that's why the Zohar says, what does it mean, Bereshit bara Elohim et HaShemayim et HaAretz? Bereshit, Reshit Chochmah Yirat Hashem. The beginning of wisdom is awe of God, which means the first place as human beings we can be doresh, we can understand, is from chokhmah and on. Anything before the bet, which means the ratzon of Hashem, is beyond human comprehension. And the Gemara tells us, or not, the Midrash tells us, if places that are above your comprehension you are forbidden to talk about. So we see that the keter is considered to be its hidden. And therefore anachnu miramzim alav bekotso shel yod. We have, we have to explain something else. Um, there's the name Yudke Vavke. And Yudke Vavke, contained within the name Yudke Vavke, is a remez to all ten of the Spirot. And how does that work? So the Yod of the Yudke Vavke represents the Chokhmah. The He of the Yudke Vavke represents the Bina. The Vav of the Yudke Vavke represents the six Sfirot that come afterwards, which is Chesed, Givura, Tiferet, Netzach, Hod, and Yesod, called in the language of the Kabbalah, the Za'er Anpin, the small face. And then the last He of Hashem's name corresponds to the Malchut, the kingship. That's the feminine aspect. That's the Shekhinah. That goes back to the shir I gave when I talked about the blood on the doorpost in the shape of a hay. That represents the Shekhinah. The Keter, where is that represented? If you look at a Yod in a Sefer Torah, there's a little thorn that's on top. A very tiny little piece of ink on the Yod. That is what's represented by the Keter. And the reason that's represented is it's so small, it's Ne'elam. It means you almost can't even see it. It's not a separate letter. It is hidden. And the Yod, out of all the letters, is the smallest letter, which means the Chokhmah is the beginning of where we can start, but we can nowhere begin to grasp all the Chokhmah of the Torah. No human being can do that. And that's the hinted over there. So we see over here that the Keter is hinted to by the Kotzoshel Shel Yud, the thorn, or that little of the Yod. Al Shem Yud Kevavke, on the name Yud Kevavke. But when we want to give a name to the Keter, But then what happens is the Kotso Shel Yod is written as Aleph Hey. Shehu Rishon Lechola Otiyot, because the Aleph is the first of all the Otiyot. Umiramez Lesfirata Keter, and it's hints to the Sfirata Keter. Shehu Harishon Hamakor Laatzilut. That that is the source of the closest world, which is the Atzilut, which it comes from the word in Hebrew Etzel, which basically means next to. There are four Alamot. We'll go into more detail about that Bezrat Hashem in the future. The highest Olam for the purposes of what we're talking about now is the Olam HaAtzilut, the world of Atzilut. That is not a created world. That world always existed. It was subsumed within the infinite Ein Sof. That's the Atzilut. The only thing that is new is that, like we talked about in one of the classes last week, is the ability to be seen. The fact that the Atzilut can be seen by us, again, not the Keter, that's above us, but the fact that the Atzilut can be seen by, and this is what the prophets are seeing, by the way, they're seeing into the Atzilut through the Malchut, which is the lower sphera of the Atzilut. And that's what it means when it says, I mentioned that a couple of classes ago on a Wednesday night. That is how the, all the prophets saw through the Malchut, which is an aspaklaria. It's like a lens. And for all the prophets, with the exception of Moshe Rabbeinu, it was an opaque lens. It was a cloudy lens. Depending on the level of the prophet, it was more clear or less clear. Good prophets that were closer had a clearer lens. Prophets that were further had a opaque lens. Moshe Rabbeinu was the only one that was able to see with a clear lens. And what did he see? He saw to the Tiferet, which is next one up if you go up in the middle. Anyway, I'm getting into too much detail here. I'm sorry. So the Atzilut is the first of the world, shall we say. There's a world before that, but I'm not going to go into detail about that now. 
Then there is the world that were created, which is the world of the Bria, which is the world of the creation, the world of the Yetzirah, which is the world of the formation, and the world of the Asiyah, which is the world of action. We physically are now in the world of the Asiyah, but the other worlds are spiritual worlds. And that's why it says Bereshit Bara. What is Bara? Bara is Yesh Me'ain. That is the world of Bria. And then Yetz, Yetz, Yetzirah is the world of formation, something that's already formed, already made, changing it and making it into something else. And Asiyah is what we would call the Makeba Patish. It's the finishing touches on the unfinished world that God left unfinished so that man can finish the world. And that's the Pasuk that says, Asher bara Elohim la'asot. The world was created for us to have action in it. We finished the world. Now, Chas Shalom is not to say that God couldn't finish the world. Of course, he could have finished the world, but he wanted to give space for man to function, so therefore he left the world unfinished finished and through completing and finishing the world this is how we connect to him continuing on in the bottom and after the aleph hey ba hayud ke so if we think about the name we're talking about aleph hey yud hey we see aleph hey represents the keter and the yud ke represents the chokhmah and the bina shem haotiyot harishonot shel shem yud ke vav ke which we said before represents the Chokhmah and the Bina, the Abba and the Ima. Umasha Keter Amuz Bekotso Shel Yod, and the Keter that's represented by the, the thorn on the top of the Yod. Be'era Benu Lekaman, our rabbi is going to explain later on, and Sha'ar Hay, which is going to discuss the name Yud Kevavke, which corresponds to the Tiferet. Shebeshem Havaya Klulim Kola Sfirot Yod Keneget Chokhmah. Then in the name Yud Kevavke, that all of the Sfirot are contained in there. Keneged the Chochma. Hey, Keneged Bina, that's what I mentioned before. The Avav, Keneged Zeranpin, which is the six Firot. The Gematria Avav, of course, is six. The Hey, Keneged Malchut, and the last Hey is Keneged the Malchut. Umatchilim Lichtov Shem Havaya Mea Chochma, Velo Mea Keter. But the name Yud Kevavke is only written from the Yud, which means the Kotz Shel Yod is not so recognizable. That's the idea that the Keter is hidden, is Ne'elam. Because contemplating above the Chokhmah, which means the Keter, which is the Ratzon of Hashem, is forbidden. Like our rabbis taught us, in something that is too difficult for you or impossible for you, you are not allowed to investigate. The odd, and it's also written, Ki a chokma me kabelet berishona ha shefa ha tahor ve azach me aketeshu ne lam. That the chokma receives from the beginning, receives abundance, the holy or the pure abundance, and the, 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 the pure abundance, me aketer, which is hidden. And from the Keter comes the Shefa, which is the abundance, and the Bracha, and the life, the Chiyut, and the existence, the Chol HaSfirot. And that's why it appears that the Chokhmah is first. That's why you have Yud Kevav Ke. The Kotz doesn't, you can't see it. And that's the concept there. Continuing on, we're going back up onto the top. Da kishem, I'm sorry, on page kaf zayin, after uh, the, the last couple of words. Da kishem ben arba otiyot hu kedimyon guf ha'ilan. That the, ne- the name of four letters, which is yud kevavke, is like the goof of the ilan. We talked about that before. We said that the majority, uh, we didn't mention this before, the majority of yud kevavke is the vav, because that's six. Everything else is one sphira, the vav is six. So the majority is the vav, and therefore that corresponds to the trunk, which is the goof of the ilan. The shem alef hey yud hey hu ikar ha ilan. But the root or the essence of the tree is not Yud Kevavke, it's Aleph Hey Yud Hey. Hazeh umimenu ishtarshu shorashim. And from there come the roots, which means the Keter is the roots. Vipashtu anafim lechol tzad vetzad. And then there are branches, which means first you have the roots, then you have the trunk, and then you have the branches. 
Ushar kol shemot hakodesh kulam bedimyon anafim. And all the other names that are mentioned, that he mentioned before, that are written in the Torah that can't be erased, are branches. The san sinim nimshachin meguf ha'ilan, that come from the trunk of the tree. The chol echad min ha'anafim oseh pri leminehu. And all of the branches bring forth fruit to others. Now let's look at the kaf aleph, with 21. Kedimyon, kedim, I'm sorry, Kedimyon Gufa Ilan. What does this mean when we say that the name Yud Kevavke is like the Guf of the Ilan? Rabbeinu Mevaer, our rabbi is explaining, Lama Anu Mishtamshim B'Shem Havaya Velo B'Shem Aleph Hey Yud Hey. Why are we using the name Yud Kevavke and not the name Aleph Hey Yud Hey? Shehu HaMakor, because the name Aleph Hey Yud Hey is the Makor, is the source, the Ashoresh and the root. Bimashal shel ilan in the parable of the ilan. Remember, all of the prophets, the way they saw things with a, was a, with a mashal. They saw things with a parable, with an image. Again, we're not talking about a physical image. We're talking about an image that's planted in their mind by Hashem. And that imagination is what they see. That's the mashal. The key to a prophet is to understand the nimshal, to understand what is that image representing? What does that mean? What is the message that God is trying to say to me as the prophet or to the people that I have to reveal this prophecy to? Continuing on. The Sfirot are called the Ilan, the tree, the holy tree. And just like in a tree, Nikar, and by the way, the Gematria of Ilan, of course, is 91, which is Yud Kevavke and Aleph Dalad Nud Yud. Nikar Rak Hageza, when a person looks at the tree, what is the most significant part that stands out to you? It's the trunk of the tree. The Loha Shorashim, but the roots are generally not visible. They're underground. They are Ne'elam. They are hidden. Ken Hanhagata Olamot. This is the same way the worlds work. Nikeret Beshem Havaya. The world is recognized through the name Yudke Vavke. Shu Keneget Gezahailan. The Yudke Vavke is like the trunk of the tree. Kumoshe Bi'er Haramak, like Rabbi Moshe Cordovero explained in the Pardes Rimonim. Vezelo Shonon. This is his Lashon. This is his language. This is what he wrote. Kichol Hashemot Enam Nim Chakim. All of the names that one is not allowed to erase, which is the ten that we mentioned in the last week's parasha, in the last week's class, but actually seven, which is ten. Hem Tuluim B'Shem Ben Dalad Otiot. They are Talui. They are relying on the name Yud Kevavke. Umimenu mit pashtim umimenu yonkim, and from them they come out, and from that name, I'm sorry, from that name it comes out, they come out, and from that name they resu- they derive sustenance. The ima shemot yonkim mit pashtim mishem yudkevavke, and if the names are getting their sustenance and getting their uh, their 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 their, uh, their from the name Yud Kevavke. Lama lo yud tuluim b'shem alef hey yud hey shuag beketer. Why shouldn't we say it's talui beketer since the keter the alef hey yud hey is a higher name? Vehu ha'ikar ve'ashoresh because that is the ikar that is the essence and that is the root. The Tiretz and the Ram- Ramak explains in the Pardes Rimonim, Kishem Aleph Hey Yud Hey Hu Ikar Ha'ilam Veshosho. It is the essence of the 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 the, the root of the tree. Veshem Havaya Hu Guf Ha'ilan is the the body of the tree. Ulafi Derech Zen. According to that way, Ha'anafim Mit Mit Pashti Mina Guf. But the branches don't come from the roots. The branches come from the trunk. And doesn't come from the roots, which means the roots make the trunk, and then the trunk makes the branches. But the keter is what, you cut the roots off the tree, the tree dies. So the roots is what brings the water and the nourishment to the tree, and that goes through the trunk and then to the branches. And therefore, the branches come from the trunk and not directly from the keter. It's by way, I'm sorry, not by way of the, uh, the, bran- the, the branches get their nourishment through the trunk from the roots. So the same thing here. The other names of Hashem receive their sustenance from the name Yud Kevavke, which is the source of everything, of course, is in the roots. 
Vatiferet who ha nof, and the tiferet is the nof asher misham mitpashtim anafim, is where all the branches come from. That's the, uh, that's the analogy of the tree. Please don't make the mistake and think there are any trees in the heavens. That's not what we're talking about here. This is all a parable for us to understand deep concepts. The katav od sham, it's also written there, shishem alef hey yud hey, this is of course still in the pardes rimonim, more al hanhaga beheelem. The, 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 that name represents the God ruling the world or running the world, but hidden. Shapiru show that its explanation, Hana Kaim Lemihave Ulhit Galot, which means it exists and it's going to be revealed. That's why if you look in the Hebrew, the name Eheye is future, going to be which means it will be. Will be what? Will be revealed. And this is revealed down below. In the lower sphero, which means it's not revealed directly from the Keter it's, or from the Ratzon. It's revealed indirectly through the other names, specifically Yudke Vavke and then to the other branches. And also the Geonim explain that the explanation of Keter, which means patience, wait, the pasuk in Iyo, Perak Lamed Vav, pasuk Bet, says, Katar li ze'er va'achaveka, meaning what? Translated into English, wait for me a bit and I will tell you. So the concept of keter means from the word katar, which means wait. Wait for what? Wait for the future. And what's in the future? That's going to be revealed. Continuing on, but don't delve into that because you have no ability to grasp it or understand it. And the only way a person can understand the Ratzon of Hashem is through the other Sfirot. We understand the will of Hashem of how He acts in the world. But to understand the why He acts that way, this is not within human comprehension. Continuing on in the bottom, in Kaf Bet, it says over there, Nimshachim Miguf Ha'ilan. What does this mean, Nimshachim Miguf Ha'ilan? Hitba'er sheshemotav hem pe'ulotav. He explained that the names of Hashem, we discussed this in the last week's class, the names of Hashem are the pe'ulot, are the actions of God, in, of Hashem in the world. Upe'ulotav haniglot lanu, and the actions that are revealed to us in the world, behan hagat ha'olam, in the running of the world, nimshachim mishem havaya, are brought from the name havaya, which means all of the actions of God in the world are through the name yudke vavke. Shehi han hagat ze'er anpin, that is the concept of ze'er anpin, small face. I'm not going to go into detail about that now, we'll leave that alone. Sheman higa et ha'olam, because the ze'er anpin is manhig the world, the yudke vavke. Behanaga shel hester, in a way of that is hidden, the chomriyut and materialism, to give place for there to be bechira, which is choice, and avoda, which is service. If the world was perfect, there would be no service for man, there would be no choice for man. God created the world in a way that the world is not perfect that there is the ability to do good and there's the ability to do bad. So therefore, the fact that the world is not perfect allows man to function, to have a purpose, to worship, to serve, and to choose. Perhaps what he's referring to is that the future worlds are going to be perfected and then the service of man is going to be different than it is what we have now. The Hanhaga of Zeran Pin is where we are right now. That's what he's talking about here. Aval Shem Aleph He Yud He Shimura Ala Keter. The name Aleph He Yud He, which is referring to will be in the future, that's referring to the Keter. The Shem Yud K and the name Yud K, which is the Yud corresponds to the Chokma and the He corresponds to the Bina. Shimura Al Chokma U Bina. It's referring to the Chokman Bina. So we have Aleph He of the Ehye corresponding to the Keter, and the Yud and the He corresponding to the Chokman the Bina. 
Continuing on, Hem Shemot Lif Ulot Shiit Galu. These are names of actions that will be revealed in the future, in the time of the Tehiyata Metim, in the resurrection of the dead. And then the way God is going to run the world is without anything hidden. Everything is going to be revealed. As ruchi al kol basar, and then the pasuk says, "I will pour out my spirit on every person, on every person alive." The tistalek hanhagat hateva vechomriut, and the hanhaga, which is now the way the world works, is through nature. The teva and chomriut materialism will be removed. This will be a much more spiritual type of world. But because this is not revealed in our world, we have, we don't have, we, these names, the name Aleph Hey Yud Hey is, is not, uh, we don't use those that's above our comprehension. Continuing on, like the Gra explained, B'Safra Ditzniuta, in the Safra Ditzniuta, which is an explanation of a certain section of the Zohar, the Havaya Hakol Hu Darga Dezer Anpin, that the name Havaya Yudke Vavke is the level of Zer Anpin, which is the world we're right in now, which is the world of choice and the world of Avodah, the world of service. Shebo Manhig Haolam, that this is how God runs the world, the Hushmo Shel Ensof, and this is the name of the Ensof. And through that name, this is how God is revealed in the world. The essential understanding or the kavana of the ensof, of the infinite, no, no end. That the, what is the purpose of the world, that what is the goal, is to reveal God in the world. And this is the function of the creation of the world. Through a Jew doing mitzvot, Torah, learning Torah, studying Torah, especially Sod, doing mitzvot and ma'asim tovim, this is how one reveals the name of God in the world. This is how we fulfill our function. And that's why a person goes from level to level, one revelation after another revelation, Ad Zeranpin until we get to the Zeranpin, the Sham Nitgale, and there it's revealed, which means this is where how Hashem is revealed through the name Yud Kevavke. The Lachen Shem Sha Zeranpin, and therefore the name of the Zeranpin, which is the six we talked about, who Ikar Hashem Amiuchad. That is the essential part of the Yud Kevavke. Because out of those letters, the Vav represents six Sfirot, where the other letters each represent only one. The Chol Hashemot Shekodmin Lo, and all the names that precede the Yud Kei Vav Kei, Aleph Hei Yud Hei, Ushar Hashemot Hen Tfelim Lo. They are Tafel, they are secondary, not that they're not Elyon, they're very high. But because we're right now in the world of the Ze'er Anpin, the world of the Avodah and the Bechira, we don't have access to those other names. Even though those names are higher in level, we do not, they are tafel, they are secondary because we cannot access those names. Uh, and that's why Yud Kevavke is the essential name. And that's what they're trying to explain. The Ha'inyan. We have to recognize the higher, the more high something is, the more hidden it is. Or another way to understand it, the higher something is, the less of a name it has. A name gives a limitation. The higher a person goes, the closer they get to the Ain't Sof. Ain't Sof has no limit. There is no name. So the higher a person is going, the name does not capture the essence of the item as well. The lower a person, the lower it is, the better the name captures it because it's closer to us. Ad she Ain't Sof en lo remez. Ensof, which is basically the infinite, the infinite, and of course we're not. Ensof is not is an emanation from God. We are not ever talking about atzmut, which is basically the essence of God. No one talk. This is beyond human comprehension. This is level upon level upon level of infinity and infinity and infinity. This is not for us to talk about. 
Ein Sof is an emanation, but it's an infinite emanation. Uh, and that's also way beyond our comprehension, the concept of the infinite emanation. But this is hinted to, lo b'hirhu v'lo b'machshava, but we don't have the ability to speak about it, we don't have the ability to think about it, because it's beyond us. Whatever becomes revealed more, or whatever is closer to us, konelo shem yoter, it acquires for itself a name, a more of a name, ki Hashem hu agilui, because the name is the actual revelation of what's on the inside, what is hidden. The chol Hashemot ad zeranpin, and all the names up until you get to zeranpin, which is yud kevavke, hem enan shemot beatzman. They're really not names. Rak al zeranpin shit gale, but they're names vis a vis zeranpin. I'm not going to go into detail about that. V'chen Hashemot Morin Ken, and this is what the names teach us. Ehyeh, she'ehyeh, achar kach velo achshav. What does ehyeh mean? It will be, which means later and not now. V'havaya, hu yihyeh behoveh. He will be in the present. That's the name Havaya. Ki yihyeh lashon hoveh, because the name yihyeh is from the language of hoveh, which means present. V'zehu shem ha-miyuchad, and that's called the shem ha-miyuchad, or the shem ha-mefurash. Ratzal Omar, what does it mean? Gilui mitziyut ein sof shenit gale bezeran pin. It is the revelation of, of, of the action of the ein sof that is revealed through the zeran pin, which is revealed through the yud ke vav ke. Ad kan leshono. Okay, let's go to Kaf Gimel, which was uh, also still on the bottom. Ose prilimino, what does it mean, makes fruit for its kind? Kol mitziyut hatachtonim, all of the essence of the lower, the lower worlds, v'chiyutam, and their, and their sustenance, v'shorsham, and their roots, ba'im mitzirufei haotiyot shel hashemot, come from the different combinations of the letters of the names of Hashem. Shebetziruf kaf bet alpha betot, through the various, there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and the Hebrew language is made by making different words out of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. It's very interesting in Hebrew, there is no word that has only one letter, not in English where you have like A, okay, and I, these are words that basically only have one letter. In Hebrew, it's not like that. The only word, the minimum amount of letters to have in a word is two. You cannot have a word in Hebrew that only has one letter. Nivru shemaim va'aretz. The worlds were created through the kalf bet otiot, through the letters of God, through the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The world was created. This is what the Gemara means when it says b'masara ma'amarot nivra ha'olam. With ten sayings, the world was created, and those sayings were said in Hebrew, not in Russian, not in English, not in Arabic. The chol tzvaot mala and all the armies of the mala umata and lower, the upper armies and the lower armies. Mereshita Bria from the beginning of creation, Ad Sof Amidata Olamot until the end of the worlds. Gam Vegam Kolchi Utam Bekiumam and all of their sustenance and all of their existence shall kola olamot of all the worlds. Hakol Hurak Al Yide Otiota Torah. They exist only by the letters of the Torah. Kid Itab Sefe Yitzira, like explained in the Sefe Yitzira. Kaf bet otiot chakikan. That through the 22 letters, the world was made. That Tsar Bahem Nefesh Kol Hayitsur, and he drew the concept of drawing, which means to form the, the, the existence of everything that is created, Bechol Nefesh Atid Latsur, and all things that would exist in the future. Kamosh Katab Od Ramchal, like the Ramchal also wrote in Kalach Pitchei Chochma, Petach Yud Gimel, in uh, opening 13, Sod HaShemot, the secret or the underlying meaning of the names, Hema Shebaim HaOrot Levchinat HaPeula, is that the Orot, that the eminence or the lights are coming through as action. Uklalotam Hi HaTorah, and the, the, the klal of all of this, of course, is the Torah. The way God acts in the world is through the, name, the names uh, in the Torah. 
Lefichach nikreta Torah kli umanuto. That's why the Torah is called the utensil of his artisanship. To translate that word for word, shel kadosh baruchu. The Torah, by way of her secrets, they are basically, that's how everything exists. To know how chadarim, which basically means rooms are made. Cheder, we'll leave that alone for now. Kidita bazoar, that's explained in the Zohar. Kesherat hakadosh baruch hu levrot haolam. When God desired to create the world, haya mistakel ba ba Torah, he would look or gaze into the Torah. Bechol milau milau in every word of the Torah, katuv bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim. In the beginning, God created the shamayim. Histakel be milazo. He looked at that statement or those letters or those words. Ubarat hashamayim. So meaning what? God looked into the Torah and that's how he created the world. God looks into the Torah and that's how he continues to have the world run. And that's why you look at the Ramban. The Ramban explains that there are really six books of the Torah, not five. <clears throat> because he says that Breshit, the first parak of Breshit, is separated from the rest of Breshit. And therefore, there are six books, and if you look at the Ramban very, very carefully, he'll explain that each one of the books of the Torah, those six books, corresponds to a thousand years of the world. And through looking at the parashot of the Torah, one can look at the history of the world and understand it as it happened through those words. Of course, it's much easier to do that after you've experienced the history, and then you look back. And Bezat Hashem, we're going to understand this a lot better. We're going to understand that everything was there. We just didn't see it coming. It was all katuv batorah, written in the Torah. And that means that what does it mean? That God is always creating the world, always renewing the creation. And how is he doing that? Mistakel batorah. He's looking in the Torah. And that's why the Ramban was able to say that if a person looks at the parashot of the Torah, he can figure out what's going to happen in the world. Ketiv or in the Torah it says, let there be light. He looked at these words, and he created the light. I think we will stop here. Does anybody have any questions? I know I covered a lot of stuff. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. I went very, very fast. I get very excited when I learn these kind of things. It would be the sixth book then. So again, if you look at the Ramban, he explains that if you look at Breshit, which is Genesis, yes? The yeah. first chapter of Genesis is its own book. And, and okay, and when we look at the Gemara, the Gemara says that there's one opinion says there's five books. Another opinion says there's seven books because Bemidbar is divided into three books according to this opinion in the Gemara. So we call it a Chumash and we divide it into the five Chumashim. And this is the way, this is of course the way it's, uh, we understand that, but we need to recognize that there's other ways to look at it. And if a person is looking at the secrets, he can understand better. I'm sorry, the Perak Bet starts off with Vayichulu. That's part of the first one. So, Ela Toledot HaShamayim Ve'atz Behi Bare'am Be'yom this is the beginning, which is basically chapter 2, verse number 4. This is the beginning of the second book. And if you look, there's a book by Gershon Schroeder, I think his name is, called Science of God. And if you look very, very carefully, you will notice that there's a change in the time reference between the first chapter of the first section of Breshit and the rest of the Torah. And that's where he shows that really when the rabbis say that the world was existed for 5,780 years and our scientists explain that the, the universe exists for 15 billion years, they are saying the same exact thing. I would encourage you to read the book. He explains it based on the theory of relativity the fact that there's something called time dilation and depends on what your point of reference is. And what he says is 
for the first chapter of Breshit, the point of reference is what we call cosmic time, which is the world was created from somewhere else. Then there is this world, which begins over here in the second uh, chapter. Anyway, we encourage you to read his book. I'm not doing it any justice whatsoever. He also has a YouTube video where he explains it very, very quickly. But the book is phenomenal. I would encourage you to read it, especially if you like science uh, and physics. Does anybody else have any questions? I'm sorry, two questions. Yes, Zohar. Whose opinion is it that there's seven worlds? It's Gemara. I'll send you the reference. I'm sorry, how would they split up again? Okay, so you look at Bemidbar. You have the beginning of Bemidbar up until... Uh, I'll show you one second. Okay, so in Parashat Behalot Echa, if you remember, there are two Nunim that are upside down. You remember that? Nun, it's a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Nun is the letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Okay? Let me just find it one second. Give me one second. Here we go. It's in, if you have a schumash in front of you, it's in Parashat Behalotecha Bemibar, chapter 10, verses number 35 and 36. The Pesukim are, Vayihi ben So Aaron, Vayome Moshe, Kuma Adonai, Vayafut So Evecha, Vayinisu Mitzanecha Mipanecha. And then the next Pesuk, Uvnuho Yomar, Shuva Adonai, Yervot Alfei Israel. There's a Nun, Hafucha, upside down Nun, before the, the first Pesuk. And there's an upside down Nun in the second Pesuk, in, in, the, in the second Pesuk. And if you look, what does the Gemara say? Second. One second. Vahibin Saaron, this is Masechet Shabbat, and Daf Kof Tet Zayin Amud Aleph, it says. Tanu Rabbanan, our rabbis taught. Parasha Zo, this parasha, which means this section, which is these two pesukim. Asa la hakadosh baruchu simanim. God, when he gave the Torah to Moshe Rabbeinu, put simanim. And the simanim were these upside-down nunim. Milmala milmata, from above and from below, which means in the beginning, before the first two pesukim, and at the end of these two pesukim. My ta'ama, the Gemara asks, what's the reason? Why is that? Amar Ribi, Ribi Yudah Nasi, what did he say? This is a book to itself. Which means, if you look at Sefer Bemidbar, from the beginning of Bemidbar up until the first noon is one Sefer. These two Pisukim is a Sefer to itself, a book to itself. And then from the next Pasuk all the way to the end of Bemidbar is another Sefer. So therefore you have seven. Okay, thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen. Thank you.